Welcome back to part two of our capstone conversations with Sarah Ellen and Betsy as we talk about Be the Bridge. Uh, we're going to pick up right where we left off last time. Never told somebody they can't buy a house in a certain neighborhood. Um, and I have not done some of these things. But we have to take communal responsibility. And the, while I have never owned a slave, and while I um, have never done all the bad things like lynching or whatever, I have benefited ultimately from those things. And um, I have benefited because I am white. And so we have to have communal grief. We have to have a shared understanding of all of our history so that we can move forward. Um, it's like we have been, and Be the Bridge, Latasha does a great job. It's like we've been in a dark shadow of our history. And I've just been living with blinders in this dark shadow, but we have to step out into the light um, and realize that I have to take responsibility. We have to take responsibility of our communal past and the harm that has been caused as well as um, how I've benefited from it and then how we can make things better. And while, again, it may not have been quite me individually, I did benefit and we do have to communally, all of us, take responsibility and grieve and lament um, mm -hmm. so that we can ask for forgiveness and then ultimately come to healing. Yeah, I pretty much echo that answer. Um, we have to acknowledge the sin and acknowledge that we are complicit in it because we are beneficiaries of the policies that have come out of um, the majority making all the decisions. We are. We, are, we have benefited from that. And before we can redeem something and restore something, there has to be an admission of wrong. And so I think that's, we've got to admit before we can move on to the next step. Yeah. All right. Um, and our next question is a multi-question question. question. <laughs> um, it says, one of the major fears about confession is wondering what others will think of us. That's a pretty common fear I think we probably all have. What do you fear your confessions will lead others to conclude about you? And how do you think others might respond to seeing the real you? So I kind of had to think through each part of this. And it really would depend on who am I talking to? You know, am I talking to a close friend? Am I talking to somebody that I just had an encounter with on social media? Who am I talking to? But um, in the first question, what do I fear my confessions will lead others to conclude about me? That um, one, it would be hard to say I am racist or I have had racist thoughts, feelings, actions, whatever. But that is the truth. So... Um, it would be hard for me to admit that I have benefited from the world that we live in because I'm white. Um, and what would people conclude about me? Um, well, they might be really mad at me. Um, they might not want to be my friend anymore. They might not respect me. Um, or the flip side of that is sometimes when you come out with the truth, people go, oh, well, me too. Mm -hmm. Or oh, no one's ever said that to me before. No one's ever admitted that to me before. And now I want to hear what else you have to say. Or no one's ever even let me talk about this before openly. And so now I feel safe and I, I want to keep talking and be in conversation with you. So it's, it's two different answers. And I think we operate in the fear of the people being mad at me part. And we don't look to, we have to, we have to sacrifice our own pride and we have to sacrifice part of ourselves so that other people can feel that they have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, I really have a very similar answer. Um, I fear if I confess publicly um, of both personal sin and racism um, and, and confess publicly that we all need to take responsibility mm -hmm. for communal sin and that we are all you know, part of the answer and addressing old sin. I fear, um, I fear losing respect from people. I fear people will look down on me. They'll judge me. Um, I fear they'll like maybe think, well, she's 
no longer worthy to be followed or listened to. Um, and, but I also put, or kind of yeah. on the flip side, what could happen is um, that they might be able to identify with me. Um, and that's the hope. Um, but a lot of times, you know, we live in fear. So don't want to confess out of fear of judgment. Um, but confession can lead mm -hmm. to other people doing the same thing and identifying with me. And if I can take those steps first, people might actually follow in those steps. Yeah. And based on what we learned just from this book and even the gospel and our relationship with Christ, confession is a part of that. Confession yeah. is a part of restoration and redemption. So yeah. it's uncomfortable. It has to happen. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. What are some of the realities? This one got was really deep <laughs> for me. Yeah. Um, and I did not make an exhaustive list of my answers. But um, what are some of the realities we as a country need to repent of in the area of racial injustice? And in addition to that, what would true repentance look like at an individual level within the local church and at a cultural or governmental level. So I'm going to let you lead off on this Thanks. one. Um, and it might be, yeah, we might have a lot of the same answers that we share yeah. here too. But. Um, so I think that, and, and to some extent, I feel like I'm being a little bit repetitive, but we have to repent of ignorance. Um, Mm -hmm. because we have had a whitewashed history and I know that is probably controversial um, and in no way we talked about this a little bit we're not trying to step on a teachers feet or educators right. feet. we're not trying to throw anybody under the bus again we're trying to take communal responsibility and all of us but the fact is we've had a whitewashed history mm -hmm. and um, and I have lived in, in ignorance of even my own implicit biases that I'm, I have in me that need to be called out. Um, and we've got to, we've got to acknowledge that. We've got to repent of that. Um, I'm rereading the question as I, as I talk. Um, so on an individual level, you know, I have to repent of ignorance. I have to be aware of implicit bias. You know, on a more societal level, we have to realize that systemic racism is still real. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we have to look to reform. Uh, we have to look to police reform. Um, we have to look into our justice system. Um, and we have to reform it. We can, yes, looking back in the past, hindsight 2020, um, but we have to take responsibility and we have to learn from it. Mm -hmm. And so while we can look back and say, oh, that was wrong, that was a bad policy, that's a racist policy, um, maybe even at the time it wasn't implemented as such um, with overt racism, but it certainly caused systematic racism. Um, redlining is real, where, mm -hmm. where um, people of color were not able to buy in certain neighborhoods. They uh, school systems were built around certain neighborhoods so that it would be mostly white or mostly wealthy. Um, and we have to acknowledge that. Um, our government has to acknowledge that. The church has to acknowledge that we have a history of, of defending slave owners. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to apologize. Um, we have to join... Um, we have to join forces with other churches, um, with people of color, um, and and listen, um, not for them to teach us, because I think that's where we can, mm -hmm. and we're like, oh, please teach us everything. No, but we have to listen to their stories. We have to elevate their voices, we have to elevate voices of people of color. Mm -hmm. um, and we uh, have to, um, I had another thought, but it lost my mind. Anyway, so elevating voices of people of color and as a church, um, even, you know, from the pulpit acknowledging that racism still exists and that it is our responsibility as Christians to reconcile that the Bible specifically calls us and um, that we have been reconciled with God. Therefore, we are reconcilers um, in this world. Mm -hmm. um, the first part of the question talks about what are some of the realities we as a country need to repent of. Mm -hmm. And I mean, slavery. Yeah. <laughs> but then trickling that trickling down to like um, 
you can follow that thread of mistreatment of people because of their race all the way through. I mean, all the way through um, to right now. And so that leads to things like unfair housing and wages, um, unfair imprisonment. Um, and I just kind of summed it all up in a, this sentence. It is a giant run on sentence, and I apologize for that. But we need to, um, as a country, repent of treating a, a group of human beings like less than and then coming up with countless reasons why they're less than and then taking those reasons as facts and turning them into laws and policies that we've used to govern ourselves. That's what we have to repent of is treating a group of human beings as less than and letting that infiltrate all parts of our lives. Yeah. And I, I mean, basically had the same answer as you, you know, admitting our personal sins. Um, I think especially as the church repenting of times and admitting times when we didn't stand up and we didn't speak up in the past and maybe even now when we didn't stand up and we didn't speak up for those that needed to be spoken up for. Okay, we're nearing the end now and we've got two more questions to go. What are some positive signs that you've observed that confirm that racial reconciliation is possible? Um, I'll start off. I want to be really careful with this because signs that change is happening is good but it doesn't mean we stop. It means we keep going. Mm -hmm. um, when, I was trying to think of a metaphor, but like um, when you've watered your plant and it grows, you don't stop watering your plant. You keep watering your plant because you want to keep growing. So um, I don't want anybody to hear this and be like, oh, well, all those things sound great and um, they're just knocking out of the park and like, I don't need to do anything. That's not at all what this is. And these are baby steps. Um, I think one of the things is having this conversation right now and um, the, the books that we're both reading and educating ourselves, that's one positive step because that is um, one thing that people of color have been asking for a long time is listen to us, listen to our stories, hear what we have to say. Um, I think it is going to take a lot more white people listening. <laughs> I know just personally for me, I'm in a book club called The Well-Read Black Girl um, at a local bookstore and I love to talk and I love to share my opinion. And one thing, one change I've seen in myself because I have been listening more is that when I feel the urge to say something, I don't. And I think that is a big step is listening mm -hmm. and not saying what I think and feel because guess what? Black people have been hearing what white people think and feel forever. And there's a time for that to be listened. Um, one specific thing just in my own family is my kids are reading a book there we're listening to it actually roll of thunder hear my cry we're listening to that book and i just messaged a friend um who's black on instagram and she was saying i need to read a children's classic and i was like "Ooh, i've got you my background's in elementary education so i was like i can help you with this so i listed roll of thunder hear my cry and another one that my kids have read and I said, we're actually fixing to read this one. I've never read it before. And she said, oh, I'm going to read that one with y'all. And I was like, fantastic. And so we are planning to have a little book talk when we're done. And I am so appreciative to her. Her name's Chastity. I'm so appreciative to her for taking um, an interest. And she's investing in my children is essentially what she's doing. And um, I jokingly asked her to be like a mentor to Ellery one day. But I think it's, um, it's good for my kids to see me as their mother having friends who don't look like her and look like them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's um, showing that, re that the reconciliation is there because we're both sacrificing to meet each other. And neither one of us, well, I will say I, I do need to sacrifice. I don't feel that she does. And I have thanked her profusely for like going above and beyond with my family and with me. So I think that's as a sign of some recon racial reconciliation being possible. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have as long of, or great of an answer except just to say that I see people, my friends, including myself, working to acknowledge the truths, the real truths of the past and taking steps to right those wrongs. Um, and so I do have hope mm -hmm. because of that. All right, and our last question is thinking through all the chapters in the book, this is from one of the last chapters, where do you think the reconciliation process most often gets hijacked and why do you think people so rarely make it to the work of restoration? Betsy, what do you think about that? So there's um, steps and I'll qu quickly go over the steps. Um, 
and it's acknowledge the truth, lament um, the harm, um, feel the shame and guilt, but move past shame and guilt to confessing sin, um, and then repenting, um, changing our behavior, going in a new direction, and then righting wrongs. Um, and so, I think, I actually think we can get kind of stuck on each one of them. Oh yeah, there's an opportunity to get stuck anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it gets hijacked right at the beginning mm -hmm. where we're not willing to acknowledge the truth of the past. Um, and um, I often hear, and I've mentioned this before, it's not my problem or I didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the lack of communal um, repentance is really a lot of times where where it'll halt and like, okay, I hear facts from the past, but I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so that lamenting, the feeling, the communal guilt and shame, communal confession, um, it's like people will like just stop because they don't want to be, um, and it is hard, but people don't want to be faced with that. Mm -hmm. um, another one is making rights the wrong. Uh, using the word reparations, it, like people would just freeze. Like I might have to sacrifice. Um, and so I think the work a lot of times will stop because people don't want to sacrifice mm -hmm. to, to make right what has been wrong. We don't want to give up our power. We don't want to give up our influence. We don't want to give up our voice. Um, and um, I, I just want to say like the from the Christian perspective, Jesus sacrificed everything for us. Um, and we are called then to live that out and sacrifice for other people. And that's the motivation for every single one of those steps. I don't really have anything to add to that. That was great. <laughs> uh, well, I wanna thank Betsy for talking through this book with me today. And we look forward to having more Capstone Conversations. We hope that you will interact um, with us um, where this is posted, um, would love to hear from you. You can contact us directly. I'll even say that. You can at least contact me directly. Yeah. And um, you can contact Walt if you want to talk to Betsy. We'll, <laughs> we'll let uh, you go through him. Yeah. But anyways, um, we look forward to having more conversations like this. So we'd love to hear your feedback. Talk to you later. <laughs>